Okay, hi everyone. My name is James. Thank you for the very warm welcome. We are at Pi Texas. It's uh, Sunday, September 27th. Uh, and the talk title here has changed from, I think, TBD to I haven't decided yet. And I need about another 30 seconds just to figure out exactly what I'll talk about. Although that's actually kind of a joke because I think everybody in the audience here more or less knows what to expect. And for better or worse. And I also have a pretty good idea where, where we'll go with this. Just imagine that um, this is kind of like seeing Gallagher in 2015. He doesn't have new jokes. It's just the same watermelon stuff over and over and over again. So you know what to expect. What I thought might be interesting to present to all of you that was touched upon very briefly in the keynote yesterday was maybe a little deeper view as to how you get to looking at the things that we looked at. I, I briefly, briefly, briefly talked about kind of this process of how I got into looking at Python internals. And maybe I thought I'd share with you a very practical way for more or less anybody in the audience, irrespective of your skill level, irrespective of your experience with Python, to get involved in or, or get interested in CPython. Now, I, I'll briefly try to give a motivating statement, uh, whether or not this is actually important or not. And I think that you can look at whether this is important in a couple of different ways. One, clearly, if you're at an event, you have to pick between which talks you want to see. So you'll either see a talk about you know, deep internals of Python, or you'll see a talk about some, some new library in data science or in web programming, some new Django plugin or something of that nature. And you might think that if you're looking at a new data science library or a new plugin in Django, that's actually very immediately useful. It's something that you might be able to turn around and put to use professionally very quickly. And it's something which you might be able to put onto your resume and it might lead to even a job opportunity. I would say that as a counterpoint, talking about Python internals or talking about deeper topics in the Python language, deeper semantics of the language, deeper understanding of the mental models, the models that are used inside the language, is beneficial, though it may not be as immediately beneficial. You might consider that it's beneficial in the sense that it could be something that is differentiating. That is to say, you know, there's a lot of people who know, who can tell you a little bit about Celery or Kafka or Flask or something like that, but this may be topics which allow you to be a little bit more insightful into why things were designed in a particular way or limitations of certain designs. And so I feel that there is at least sufficient motivation for me to expect a little bit more excitement out of the audience. Um, what I wanted to present to you was a very ad hoc and very casual approach to how you could learn a little bit more about Python. Although one thing that you might see me do in this talk is be very specific about Python versus C Python. This is really a talk about C Python. It's a talk about Python that's written in C. And you might very reasonably ask, why do we care about Python that's written in C? You know, there are other Python interpreters out there. There's Iron Python, there's Jython, there's PyPy. And uh, an argument in the other direction might be that it turns out that C Python is one of the most commonly used Pythons. It's a reference implementation. It's where the language started. Uh, there are people using PyPy. There are people using Jython. I'm curious if anybody in the audience has ever used Iron Python, because although I've heard a lot about the project, I have yet to personally meet anybody who's using that. And I'm curious if anybody in the audience is a heavy user of Jython or PyPy or any of the alternate interpreters, just because my experience has been that most people using Python today are using you know, same C Python that's been around since 1991. I would also say that we have to be careful in these kind of talks to not miss the forest for the trees. Now, bear in mind, I am always very nervous giving talks. So if I happen to spit any cliches at you and I get them backwards, I do apologize. So let me think, is it the forest for the trees or the trees for the forest? And then, now that I'm thinking of that, I'm trying to wonder, what does that even mean? Well, what it means is, how, 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 how much different? I mean, it might be a little bit sexier, or it might be a little bit fancier, a little bit more seemingly sophisticated to dive into some, to some obscure C internals. But that could be just as trivial as learning, oh, here's just another Flask plugin, or here's just another you know, data science tool, or another 
way to munge data. It could be just as trivial as that. And so I think that we should be very careful, or at least we, we should keep an eye on some deeper meaning beyond just, oh, here's just another tool and how it works internally. Because that itself is of somewhat limited use. You may find yourself not really using Python, or even Python might change over the next five or 10 years. And so all the content that's presented in this talk may no longer be relevant. So it's important to try and figure out what can we divine from this that has some more lasting value than just a rote description of C Python and Python internals. I can tell you a couple of things that we can do along those lines. The first is just a generalized practice or process for how you can look at a large software project with no understanding of that project or no upfront knowledge. Just a pretty straightforward way to just kind of look at a project and try and understand it, especially a project that's written in C running on Linux or OS X. It's a transferable skill and a skill that I find that I use a lot when I look at big pieces of software that I've never seen before. And I'll, I'll say that it's not a very formal process. It's just kind of an ad hoc way that is very low stress. And you know, a, a lot of you may, may feel that you're not quite at a stage where you can even talk about things like the C Python interpreter. But I think, I think I'll and try to endeavor to show you. I'll endeavor to show you that it's quite, it's very much within your grasp. That said, I think that there's also quite a bit here to talk about underlying semantics. And what that means is, yes, if we look at the CPython interpreter, it's just lines of C code. And who cares, right? I mean, it's, it's just memorizing lines of code that somebody wrote for something. And this year it's CPython, and next year it might be some other language. And what, where's the meaning behind that? Well, I think that if you're interested in Python, and if you think that you might be using Python a lot, and you might be using Python in many different ways, and interacting with a lot of code that other people have written, and you might be trying to write code that a lot of other people need to write, it'll be important to have a very strong grasp of certain design constraints of the language, and certain models that the language embody, or, or cert certain core models of the language, certain core concepts of the language. And I think that one way that you can do that is instead of reading documentation, you can actually see how the reference, reference implementation was implemented, how the C Python interpreter was implemented, and divine certain limitations that Python has from that. So without too much further ado, let's take a look. So the way that I would start this, and the way that I would start if any of you were interested in trying to figure out what's going on under the hoods with Python, how does Python really work? Why is it that you know, this feature works in this particular fashion? Why is it that we see this combination of these two features? Why can't I do this? Or is it possible to do something else? Is start with python.org. Python.org is a great starting point in many of life's problems. And you go to downloads, and you can download the source code for Python 3.5. And it'll download this little tar.xz. And this may, for many of you, be the first time you've ever seen a .xz file, because I know that when I started getting into C Python, you know, I, I'd been a, a, a C++ programmer from a much older generation of C++ programmers, and so we weren't even up to date on all of the new things that, that are available to us, and I was surprised that it wasn't a gzipped file, but it's an xzipped file. Things change over time. And then I'll actually remove the Python that I have installed here. And I'll show you what you do from that. So you've downloaded this Python 350.tar.xc. So we'll just extract it. And we extract it. And this is, I mean, this is literally the first steps that I took when I was getting really interested in Python. I'd used Python for maybe six months before that, and I'd played around with it. And I knew that there were parts of the language that seemed really easy to learn, and there were other parts of the language that seemed a little bit confusing. What is a decorator? How do decorators work? What are generators? What's a context manager? What's really going on behind, behind the scenes? And I'd read a lot of posts on Stack Overflow to try and explain these different concepts. And I'd read a lot of blog posts saying, oh, decorators are great for this purpose. Context managers are great for this purpose. And I know that even now, they've added things to Python 3.5, uh, async, these async mechanisms. And I read through some of, the, some of the posts they had online, and I couldn't make tops or tails of it. And 
at some point in the near future, I need to do a deep dive and figure out what's going on. And my starting point for that would be you know, the C code. So let me change, I'll change my uh, syntax highlighting. I think that might be a little bit easier to read. But you can see what this did was it extracted and dumped out a whole bunch of files. Let's take a look at what it dumped out. Go into that directory. And we'll see this is more or less the Python that you and I run every day. Now we know a couple of things about Python. We know that at some point at the beginning of our day, we turn on our computer and we type Python or we type Python 3 and it starts up something that looks like this. And in this thing we enter lines of code and it evaluates them. And we might call this an interactive console, we might call this a REPL, there's many different names for this. We also know that you know, at some points we might have a .py file and we type Python 3 or Python 2 and the name of the .py file and it executes it. And we may even say that you know, at the top of some of our scripts you might have this shebang line, this pound sign and the exclamation point and that's what triggers the Python interpreter. But from this we can surmise that Python is just a program that interprets some code that's written in some particular format. This here represents all the things that are necessary to build that program. And so I'll show you how you build it, and I'll show you how we can make some sense of it. If you have been around Linux machines prior to, I'd say, the contemporary era, so going back maybe 10 years, you might be familiar with how we used to build software on Linux before people really understood how important package managers are. And so it used to be that you type configure, and then you type make, you type configure like this, and it would go off and spit some nonsense to your screen. And the only times you'd ever actually look for, what it, for anything there, or even understand what was being printed to the screen, is if it broke. And then what you'd do is you'd post to a mailing list something really angry saying, this thing sucks, it doesn't work. It says it's looking for K, KQ or KPOL or whatever, and I can't find it. And then somebody would post a, a, an insulting response to you. Or if you're on IRC, it would get even more heated. But for the most part, it would do some magic behind the scenes, and you just kind of pray that it would get to the end without printing out anything nasty to the screen. And sometimes you couldn't tell if it had gotten to the end successfully, or if it had printed something nasty to the screen, but you just couldn't tell that it was something nasty. And so you then just try the next step. And if the next step worked, then you know, okay, I'm good. And you kind of just wait there with bated breath for it to work. You can see I just type make, and it's going and it's doing its thing, and we have no idea what this is all about. It's doing something with GCC, and we can probably surmise GCC is a C compiler, so it's compiling some C code. Um, I'll tell you, uh, one of the organizers for the event, Kevin, he said to me very casually yesterday, he said, uh, you know, not everyone's that, that comfortable with recompiling their C Python. And I said, I agree. I agree completely. And I think one of the reasons for that is if you're on Windows, it's actually pretty tricky to do. You have to have a nice build environment set up. And if you're on OS X, it's not tricky to do, but you have to install a lot of additional stuff. Uh, you have to install a lot of dependencies. I'll tell you, if you're on Linux, especially if you're on Ubuntu, doing this is absolutely and completely trivial. And the reason for that is if you're on Ubuntu, you have a tool called apt-get, and you can pull the build dependencies for something, and you can have Ubuntu's package manager automatically install everything that's necessary in order to build something. So with one command, you can install all the pieces that are necessary in order to build Python, and then you can go through this configure, make, make install process, and it'll just kind of work. So here it's doing a make, and I should probably clock up, should probably switch to performance mode here, just to make sure this thing finishes in time. So it's doing some steps. So, so when Kevin told me that, I said, yes, Kevin, but one of the reasons that I really took to Python when I first took to Python was I was working on this large C++ project. It was a trade system. Front to back, you know, it was being used in the front office, the mid office, and the back office. It was actually nicely designed. It had been written 15 years prior and maintained by about 100 to 200 programmers over the last 15 years. But it was one of those things where you were given instructions for how to build it, which was you check it out of, I think we were using ClearCase or something even older than ClearCase. You know, that's always a bad sign when you're like, oh, maybe we should be using CVS. And they're like, CVS, what's that? Or you say, maybe we should be using Subversion. And you say, Subversion, what's that? And gosh, heaven forbid you mention Git or Mercurial, because those things did exist at the time. Um, but you check it out of ClearCase, and they say, okay, 
you type this command, cmake, and then it'll run for 15 minutes, and then it'll print a nasty error message to the screen. And when you do, what you do is, you just type cmake again, because it doesn't take the first time. And you're like, wait, what do you mean? It doesn't take the first time. So you don't know what's wrong. It's broken. But you just have to do like this, this specific incantation twice. And I thought, this is absurd. And it was like 30 minute build time for, and, and it was a 30 minute build time for this application that was only about a million, two million lines of code, which for 200 programmers over 15 years is a pretty decent amount, but not an astronomical amount. And I, I was, you know, I was working on these work machines and they were running a very old version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which means the packages were, you know, still, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything too mean about Red Hat, but we do know that they are very conservative about keeping things up to date. So I think the Python version it had was like the version that Guido had written when he was a high school student, like 73 years ago. So it had a really old version of Python. So I had to build my own Python for the, for the machine because it didn't have a, a, you know, I was reading blog posts online, I was reading Stack Overflow questions. They were talking about Python 2.3 or 2.4. And I didn't even have a Python 2.3 or 2.4, so I had to build it on that machine. So I had to do this configure, make, make, install process. Well, when I did it and I typed make and I saw it build a Python in five minutes without actually taking the first time, I was like, this is absolutely absurd. You know, we're, we're professional software developers being paid a lot of money, and yet we have this volunteer project that people aren't being paid money to work on that has a far better build process, that has a, that has a far more understandable build process than we have. This is something that I need to get into. This is something I need to learn about. This is something I need to become involved in because this is, this is good software. This is what good, so, good software looks like. And it doesn't take money, but it does take passion, it takes interest, and it takes skill. But this is what's important. So I would say yes, not everybody is that comfortable typing these incantations, configure and make. But I tell you that it gets much worse than it. Python is written for you to be, for, it's written to be used, it's written to build easily. If you run into problems in this process, those are problems that people are willing to address and that people are happy to address. And so you shouldn't feel too much intimidation yet. Having typed make, you can see this built a file right here. This file here did not exist prior to that. And this is a Python interpreter. And if I run it, you can see I have a Python 3.5.0. Now one thing that I'm going to do to make this a little bit easier for me is I'm going to rebuild this. I'm going to pass it some C flex. And this part, you don't really have to worry too much about. Four, oh, zero. I'm just going to do that to make some of the examples that are coming up a little bit easier. But it's not a necessary part of this. So here, all of us, if we have managed to stay awake so far, should be able to have a, a built Python. And then we can start looking into that and figuring out some interesting things about Python, some interesting things about how the interpreter works, and maybe, well, look, it actually finished even faster if you build it in parallel. So there we go. We have our Python. Now, what I said was, when I was first getting into Python, the, one of the first things that I did was I learned about this disk module, because I knew I have this interpreter, and I know this interpreter has to be interpreting something. It has to be compiling some code that I've written into something that the machine can run. And I know it's not, compi it's, I know it's not compiling it to machine code. I know that Python is not like C or C++, where I take source text written by a human being and it compiles it to assembly that's run directly by the machine or run with a fewer intermediating layers. I know that it takes source code written by a human being and turns it into some intermediate format that the compiler can understand. And I might have some sense that this is often called bytecode, especially since Java has been very popular for a very long time, and we've heard people talk about Java bytecode for ages and ages and ages. So I know that there's some bytecode here. And I might not know anything about the C Python interpreter other than it has some special instructions that it interprets. It has some, it's what we would classically have called a virtual machine, but now virtual machines mean something else. But it's a, it's a machine within a machine. And so I might be curious what that bytecode might look like. And so the starting point for that is this disk module. The other starting point 
that I might have is I might import the inspect module because the inspect module has a lot of really neat things in it that might be helpful for investigating Python. But usually what the inspect module has is it has things that are interesting for investigating Python from within Python, investigating Python code from within Python. But this module is the entry point to investigating Python C, C code from Python and investigating certain critical things about how the CPython interpreter works. That this module can teach you a lot about Python. And you wouldn't think it could, but it can. It can teach you that Python is a very ignorant language, or at least it's a language where the interpreter is very ignorant. And another way that we say this is that it's very dynamic. But the use of the word ignorant is actually very pointed here, and I'll show you why. Let's say I have a function, and all this function does is it returns the addition of the number two and four. This doesn't do anything interesting. And say I disassemble this function, and I look at the bytecode that's run behind the scenes by the CPython interpreter. And we can see the CPython interpreter is kind of smart. It realizes that two plus four is always going to be six. So it says, and I'll read this for you, this is the line of code. This is the line of code that it's referring to. These are the bytecode offsets. This is the actual instruction that's run by the CPython interpreter. This is the argument it's given. And this is the interpretation of the argument. So you can see all this function does is it loads a six and it returns it. Pretty simple. Let's make this a little bit more complex. X plus Y. And then we'll disassemble it again. And we, can, we don't have to know anything except we can kind of guess, okay, this loads X, this loads Y, it calls something called binary add to add them together, and then it returns it. Right? This loads x, it loads y, it does this binary multiply instruction, and it returns that. And we can see certain patterns beginning to emerge. Now one thing we can see is this. It loads x, it loads y, it calls the function y, calls this call function, which calls a function y, with no positional arguments and no keyword arguments. It does a binary multiplication of the two results, and it returns it. Now, there's one thing that we can see here that's very interesting, which is this is all there is to the CPython interpreter. CPython interpreter has no JIT, has no just-in-time. Every single time this function is run, it'll do a load fast, a load fast, a call function, a binary multiply, and a return value. Call function has no clue what it's been passed. Binary multiply has no clue what it's been passed. It doesn't know if those are integers. doesn't know if those are numbers. You know, I could pass f as a string and y as a function that returns a number. I could pass x as a number and y as a function that returns, or I could pass this as a list and, and y as a function that returns a number. I could pass y as something that's not a function and x as something that cannot be multiplied, so just like a raw object and it'll give me an exception. You can see the Python interpreter has no clue what it's been passed. So what you can see here is part of the dynamism of Python is that the bytecode is so simple, and the way that these are implemented is done without any knowledge of the objects that you're given. And you also see something very interesting about Python, which is this call function, this thing that this is a function, what, what Python considers a function, is really limited to just having parentheses after it. Python doesn't know if that's a C function. It doesn't know if that's a user-defined function written in Python. It doesn't know if that's a class that's instantiating an instance. It doesn't know if that's a generator that's instantiating a generator instance. It has no clue what it is. In fact, what we can see immediately here is that Python has what you might call some ad hoc protocols. It has ways to refer to the interactions between different objects that exist without a lot of knowledge of what those objects actually are. So we know that there's something that we can put parentheses after that, and that's what we call a callable. But really, what it is, it's just something Python sees parentheses after it, and it runs some code path that dispatches in different ways, depending on what it is. But in terms of the API that's being provided, in terms of what Python knows, it doesn't really know what that is. And so this is actually, I think, already something very useful for us, because we can think if we're designing an API, our API really should think in terms of the amount of knowledge that Python knows. Python doesn't really care if you pass it something that's a C function, a Python defined function, a type, or a generator. If it can put parentheses after that and it doesn't raise an exception, then that's a callable and it's good to go. And this is, I think, a little bit 
closer to the core of what duct typing is all about and a little bit closer to the core of what Py Python's dynamicness is all about. That Python fundamentally has no clue what's happening when you give it two objects and it has to go through all of these dynamic dispatch steps to determine what the actual operation is. But at, at the layer of writing your code, at, at, in terms of as the code executes, Python only knows what operations it's performing once it sees those two objects and is actually performing the operation on them. This is in part why Python is very difficult to optimize because there's no way to provide that upfront information to Python about, oh, these are actually two integers and you can, you know, X and, X and Y are always guaranteed to be two integers and you can just put a assembly language integer multiply instruction there. Python has no clue. It has to figure out every single time live, what are these two objects and how do we determine them? And let's take a look at how that works. So I saw this binary multiply and I told you that this is not, this is not a joke, this is not you know, humble bragging. The, literally the way I got into C Python was I built this, I built a Python because it was the only way for me to use Python on that machine was to build my own Python unless I wanted to use Python you know, 2.1 or something preposterously out of date. And then I grep for binary multiply because I was curious. I was like, well, where, where does this thing come from? And I'll show you, I'll show you if I grep for it, where it comes from. And there's a bunch of different hits and you can see there's a couple of hits that are a little bit more interesting than others. Every time you see this binary file matches, that's usually something you can ignore. I'm looking for a source code file that talks about this. And you can see peephole and opcode targets. But what seems, and this is documentation down here, but the one that really stands out, and especially stands out if we were doing this demo in Python 2, is this ceval.c. It has the word eval in it, which suggests to me evaluation. Maybe this is the C code file where they show you how the Python interpreter actually evaluates the bytecodes. I think that would be a very reasonable assumption. And in fact, that's what it is. So let's take a look at that file. Now before we do that, just to simplify things a little bit, I'm going to run a little command over here just to build some C tag so we can jump around without having to do too much grepping. So we'll open up ceval.c and we'll find binary multiply. Here we find binary multiply. Now in Python 3, they've actually changed the body of the CPython interpreter, the actual main interpreter loop to be, I think the term of art here is direct threaded. What this means is that in Python 3, it's a little bit harder to kind of see what's going on versus in Python 2, where it's immediately obvious that what you have here is a gigantic switch case statement. And if you're familiar with C, you know a switch case statement is you have some value, you have some variable, and you switch on its value. And so you have some opcode, and these are all the code blocks that correspond to them. And this is what you'd think an interpreter would be. It would be a switch case statement nested inside Keep scrolling up. It's a bunch of junk up here, nested inside an infinite for loop or an infinite while loop, right? It's just a loop that says, grab the next instruction, switch to the code that implements it, implement it, go to the next instruction, switch to that code, implement it, and so forth and so on, right? And that's exactly what CPython is. If you have an opportunity to follow this exact same process, and I've done this with other interpreters for other languages, this is not something that you can take for granted. If you have an opportunity to work in PHP and you look at the Zend PHP interpreter, it is not as easy to understand what's going on internally as in CPython. This is literally, if you said, how do I want to write an interpreter? This is exactly how you want to write an interpreter, which is, which is amazing because this is not only a useful productive tool that we can use for real work, but it's also something that has enormous educational value for us in trying to understand not only how you'd write an interpreter, but also you know, how the language works. But, but think about that. It's not only easy to use and effective, but it's also easy to understand and easy to intuit. So let's go back down to our binary multiply. In our binary multiply, we can see a couple of things. And we can learn some things about Python from here. Bear in mind, some of you in the audience may have no understanding of the CPython interpreter. Some of you in the audience may only barely know what Python is. Some of the audience hopefully know where you are right now, maybe. But if not, I'm, 
we'll, we'll try to do this without any assumptions. So here, having made no assumptions, we see there's some block of code for binary multiply. This is what happens when Python multiplies objects. And let's, let's try to go through this without having to know anything about anything. We'll do this exactly the way I did it. Well, I saw left and right. It's probably the left and the right arguments, right? Because you multiply, and multiplying is binary. You multiply two things. You multiply a thing on the left, the thing on the right, and it gives you a result. And how do you get the thing from left and the right? One says pop, and the other says top. Well, you could think that we have result values. We have arguments, and we can think, where, where do they get put? And we have a sequence, you know, the, the CPython is an interpreter and has to evaluate things. And we might remember from way back in our computer science days that some interpreters are register-based and some are stack-based. And we can see from this very clearly that CPython is stack-based. That you have some stack and every time you perform an operation, you pull the two, op the two top or the, the operands from the top of the stack. And when you're done, you push that operand back onto the top of the stack. This is one of the keys to the lightning talk that I gave yesterday, which is every time you have to look at a variable in Python, you have to push it to the stack for something to look at it or pop it off the top of the stack. So if you can put breakpoints on that, then you can implement read watches. Once you have this left and right value, you call this function pi number multiply. And this is also very leading because you'll see if you try and follow the pattern between all of these that you have some of these functions, pi number underscore multiply that matches up with binary multiply, pi number underscore matrix multiply that matches up with matrix multiply. Remember, this is Python 3.5. You have, if you go further down, you'll see some pi unicode, oh, well, we'll skip that one, that's kind of boring. Uh, pi object get item for binary subscript, that's when you, when you do your square bracket lookup. And you can see there are all these functions that match up to the opcodes very closely, and some of them are pi objects, some of them are pi number, and you'll see some of them are things like pi sequence. And you can think that Python has another layer of protocols in terms of the built-in objects itself. There are certain operations that you can perform on any object. You can take any object and you can perform that square bracket. The syntax will allow it. And if that's implemented, then it'll go off and run some code. If it's not implemented, it'll raise an exception telling you type error or not implemented error or some type of error saying, well, we don't support putting square brackets after us. We don't support putting parentheses and pretending that we're a function and calling us. And you can see, this is part of the protocol. The core objects have these protocols. And you'll see if you look at the core object, which we're going to look at, or we'll skip ahead and we'll look at it right now, uh, object h, you can see that in Python, everything's a pi object or a pi object pointer. And if you look at that pi object pointer, and we'll just keep scrolling down, let's find a sequence. You'll see that there are these protocols here, these are all the number methods. So there's things which are considered numbers, which support these number methods, addition, subtraction, multiplication, or some subset of them. There are these things called sequences that support operations like length, and so that would be the top level len function or the underscore len underscore function. Concatenation, which would be its interpretation of the plus. Repeating, which would be its interpretation of the times. Things like ass slice, which is what, which is what happens when you I know, this is a really bad name. There's actually, there's, there's, it, gets, it gets worse, but yeah. Which is, which is for assigning a slice, so that's what happens when you use the square brackets with something inside, which could be a number or it could be a number and colons, and you set it equal to something. You can see contains when you use the in operator and so forth and so on. And then finally, you have the mapping methods, which are things like your ass subscript and so forth and so on. Yeah, it gets, there, there, there are, oh, and you can have your, here's your async stuff. This is what I have to look at. So you can see there's some protocols built into language in terms of some abstract or arbitrary object can support some abstract or arbitrary protocols, and these are how they're implemented. Let's see what happens when you call pi number multiply. So we'll jump to that function here, and here we have that function right here. And all I've done is I've, I've used a little feature of Vim and C tags to jump around, but you could just as easily have grepped for a pi number multiply, and this is the code that runs. And so now we're beginning to kind of see how the C Python interpreter works. Now one thing that I'd love to show you is that I did this originally when I didn't have as strong an experience in using a debugger, which meant that I did this statically. I just kept, I grepped and I read through code, and then I followed all the paths, and I read through more code, and it took me an enormous amount of time. 
If you have a debugger and you can use a debugger, you can make this fast work. Well, here in pi number multiply, what it does is it tries to call this binary op1 function. So what does that do? Well, we go to that function and we see what that does. And we can see it tries to figure out um, if, this, this gets a little bit tricky, but it, oh, it does get a little tricky here. It, it tries to implement all of the possible binary operations. So it tries to figure out if this object has like a, you're doing a binary operation, so an add. So it tries to figure out, okay, does this thing have an underscore add implemented? Does it have an underscore r add implemented? And so forth and so on. And if it does, and the types match up, you have to do a little bit of fanciness because you could think these could be subclasses and they, both, they might both have add or r add implemented, so which one do you choose to, to uh, invoke? And it does that, and if it can't manage to get a result from that, it returns not implemented. And if a return's not implemented, because it doesn't have an underscore add implemented or an underscore r add or underscore mole in this case, then it tries to see if these things are sequences, and if they're sequences, it tries to repeat them. So like multiplying a string times four repeats the string four times, or multiplying a list times four repeats the, f the list four times, then it implements that. So you can see it's actually that multiplying a string or multiplying a list is the slow path in this particular case. Not that that has that much relevance. You can see this is more or less what happens. So every single time Python sees A times B, it has no clue what A is, it has no clue what B is, so it has to go down this step and determine what is A, what is B, what does the operation A times B actually mean. It is up to you, the programmer, to define for Python what that might mean. And so this leads to another key of API design in Python, which is Python, being completely ignorant of how these objects work, just talks about protocols. And it talks about protocols constrained to things like numeric protocols or mapping protocols, but what you have the opportunity to do is to present Python with, okay, I have all these objects and they represent some constructs that help me solve a problem. There's a library that was added to the standard library, Pathlib, that allows you to manipulate system paths, file folders and directories and things like that. And what Pathlib allows you to do is it allows you to add paths together and it'll concatenate them. So you can say, well, here's my C drive and I can add my documents directory, I can add this and it'll concatenate them. And the designer of that API said, okay, my objects are paths, and the operations that I perform are addition, which means concatenation, and here's what it means to concatenate these. And presumably, if this is a good API, they've done this in such a way that you can infer some properties for it. Now, one of the complaints that you might have is that typically, when we talk about addition, we mean more than just some operation that, that means kind of adding. We, talk, we mean that it, it's something that could be associative, that's commutative, that could be transitive, and none of those fit for, uh, let me check. It's neither, it is associative, but it's not commutative for pathlib. So you could think that maybe this is not a good API decision because certain things that you assume to be able to do with addition, you can't really do with paths. There's no additive inverse for a path. There's no additive identity for a path. So you might think, okay, maybe this is not a very good API. Or you could just say, well, nobody really cares that there's an additive inverse or an additive identity, and instead, we're just doing this because it's a convenience, it's better than, adding, than writing out a dot add method, or a dot append, or a dot concat method, or something like that. But you could think that in building an API in Python, what you're doing is you're identifying for Python ways that abstract objects can interact with each other, certain properties that you can assert to the program about how these interactions work, and then presumably when you let your program out into the wild, and it runs over data that you've never seen, input data that you've never seen or could never have expected, those properties hold, and the system behaves in a reasonable or reliable fashion. This is the core to API design in Python. Let's, let's keep diving down into the weeds, and the one thing I want to show you is how we can learn something about Python a little bit faster than this, kind of stepping through and reading the code simply process, and I'll show you how to debug Python from GDB. This is something that uh, CD source zero. This is something that you might think is very obscure, but actually I find that I run Python from within GDB very often. And the reason I find that is 
especially if you're working with data science, you have a lot of libraries that might be written in C or even Fortran. And a lot of those libraries can cause all sorts of errors. They can seg fault, they can break. And it might be useful to run Python from within GDB just to figure out why is this breaking. I've had this happen to me a number of different times, even with, even with apt, even with my package manager. I've had it you know, try to run some build process. And somewhere, some, some script that it runs falls over and doesn't emit an error. And all I just want to figure out is why did that thing fall over? I've done this with, you know, to some limited extent with things like PyCuda. There's some error that's being emitted and you want to figure out well, where is the error happening even if I not, can't necessarily do something about it. So let's run GDB and I'll give it a couple of flags just to keep its output simple. Oh, I hate, I hate this uh, Python GDB. I don't want this for now. So there we go. And here I have Python under GDB. I can type run, and I have my standard Python interpreter. I can do control C to get myself back into GDB. When I'm in GDB, I can put breakpoints. So I can put a breakpoint in C eval.c on this line here, line 1500. All right? I can continue running Python, and it'll happily continue taking code from me. And then, if I try to multiply two things together, GDB will break on that breakpoint, and I can actually step through and see what happens inside the Python interpreter, how it dispatches. This is something that I found when people would come and ask me Python questions, I'd do a lot. Because people would ask me things like, well, what's the default? When you, when you sort objects and you haven't defined less than or equal or greater than, how does it do the default sorting? And you, this is something that you could Google for, and you could find a Stack Overflow post. And sometimes I find that those responses are not quite exactly what I'm looking for to answer my question, or maybe they might be out of date, and I find that it's oftentimes easier and more satisfying to find the answer myself. Turns out that CPython is so easy to read and so easy to navigate, the source code is so easy to navigate, you can actually find the answer yourself most times. So you just kind of dive into the code and you see, okay, what actually happens when you perform a sorting and you haven't determined, you haven't defined for Python if two objects are equal to each other or less than or each other. I find I do this a lot, you know, I was using, um, the JSON encoding and decoding library in the standard library, and I found that it was missing, uh, you know, it was, it was crashing because it was trying to automatically pickle something or it was trying to automatically encode something and it was missing an encoder and the encoder was written wrong. Ran under GDB, I, do I dove down into the code, I read a little bit of code here and there, I figured out how it worked, and then I was able to, instead of kind of spending a day writing all these artifices on top, I was able to find the one missing flag that I wasn't passing or the one missing bit that I was forgetting to do as opposed to what would have previously been a strategy, which is, well, I try it this way, or I find some code that somebody else, use, some, somebody else is using that works, and I try and shoehorn that into what I want to do, and I end up with 15 lines to solve a problem that really just took one missing undocumented flag. And I think we've all had that experience where you know, the answer to the solution was the one missing undocumented flag, and you feel like such an idiot when you find that one undocumented missing flag, and you also feel like murdering the person who failed to put that in the documentation. Because you're like, this could have saved me so much of my life. My kids hate me. You know, I haven't seen my kids in the last five weeks because you can't document your software. So let's, let's follow this. Now one interesting thing you can do is you can do a backtrace. So we can see one thing I love to do whenever looking at a big software project. I like to put breakpoints in interesting parts. Let the software run, break, because I think I, I, I guess I grew up in an era when we were taught to desk check our programs that is statically read source code and jump through source code to say, okay, this function calls this function, and they kind of go through listings in that fashion. And so I always like to find what's the entry point. When you run a program, what's the first line of code that's actually run? And then to be able to trace from that very first line of code to the actual code that you want. And I find that that's very, very tedious to do by hand. But with a debugger, it's very, very easy. So you can see Python is just a C, just a C program, and it has a main function. And that main function just calls a pi main function. And that pi main function just calls this pi run any flags or interactive loop flags. And if you get into the, if you look at the embedding talks that I gave in previous years, or you get into C Python embedding, you'll see that these are actually very meaningful. This is a C API, which allows you to run Python code. So if you have like a C program and you want to put a Python interpreter into it, you'd actually call these functions directly to, em to embed Python as maybe a scripting language or a configuration language. And you can see then it runs pyeval or run mod for running a module, which evaluates some code. 
and then it gets down to evaluating the frame, and that's when you're actually evaluating some specific frame, some specific piece of code, and stepping through those byte codes until you're done. And so you can see some interesting things from this. Now, one thing that I'll show you is uh, Python has been designed, CPython has been designed as a reference implementation. And so in many cases, they have avoided optimizations that they felt added complexity to the code, even if they may have you know, been able to speed things up. One of the consequences of this is that CPython is written to be understood by anyone and everyone who's interested. It's also intended to be used, we, we already feel this when we use Python. Python was a language that was intended to be used by human beings. And it was intended to be, it was a language that people are intended to use and enjoy using. As opposed to, you know, I, I spent a lot of time writing C++, and C++ is a language which, it's only incidental that a human being will use it and enjoy using it. And frankly, if there's a choice to be made between adding a zero cost abstraction that is, you know, perfect of its, if, of, 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 the, of its most minimal requirements on the system to evaluate, but causes great suffering for the human programmer to actually use, well, who cares about human beings? We've got to make the computer happy. Whereas Python has really, the Python designers and the Python implementers have really bent over backwards to make it a language that is pleasant for human beings to use, and only incidentally effective or efficient for the computer to use. And they've done a great job at balancing the two of those. And we can see that Python is, in fact, a very effective and useful tool in real life, and also a very pleasant tool to use. Well, it goes all the way down to even this level, because you can see they've added all of these different things to the CPython distribution to allow you to do things like debugging this really conveniently. So if I backtrace again after sourcing this one file, you'll see I can see every layer of every function that's being run in the C code with interpretations of all the code that's being passed to it. So if I were breaking, let me, let me run this again, or let's continue, and let me do that multiplication inside a nested function. Let's just kind of go a couple layers deep. Right? And if I do a backtrace here, I should be breaking on this point here, which is inside the evaluation of this function, which is inside the evaluation of this function. You can actually scroll down and you can see all the evaluations of the functions going down. And you can see one last thing about Python, which is there are, I mean, there is a direct correspondence between the lines of Python code that you write and lines of C code that are implemented. It is possible to compile Python to machine code by first transpiling Python to the, C, to the equivalent lines of C code and then compiling the C code. And this is, in fact, what the Cython project does. What you can see, though, is for every one line of Python code, there are an enormous number of lines of C code that are running. This is even beyond, you can think that, you know, for one JSON call, if you for one call to like encode or decode JSON, it'd be like 500 to 1,000 lines of C code to implement that. And you have one line of Python code, if, you know, for simple tasks like sorting using a key function with a list comprehension, it would be 1,000 lines of C code to write that. And it's only one line of Python code. Well, it's still 1,000 lines of C code, it's just 1,000 lines of C code that you don't have to worry about, because it's running in the C Python interpreter. What you can also see is that this enormous and aggressive expansion from one line of Python code corresponding to so many lines of C code is actually not a disadvantage for Python, but it's a missed opportunity for us as Python programmers. What I mean is this. You might say, well, Python's inefficient. And the reason Python's inefficient is when I want to do something simple like multiplying 10 times 4, Python has to go through all of these layers and go through all of the C code to actually implement that. And if I had just written a C function and I put 10 times 4, it would have ended up as a single assembly language instruction and only a couple of bytes of C code and like a 3 kilobyte executable and it would be great. This is true. However, you can think each one of these layers here is a layer that does something important. And it's a layer that handles the dynamic of the language, handles the ability for a user to have monkey patched, you know, the len function to have changed core parts of the language to have toggled all of these flags. Each one of these layers is a layer where you can encode some part of your model. And one thing that's a missing opportunity, if you find that you're working on large Python projects and these Python projects end up looking like big Java projects, there may be something missing. You may be missing the enormous space in which you can encode the complexity of the problem you're trying to solve into the language itself. This is a very deep topic 
we can talk about this after this presentation because we're about to wrap up, but we shouldn't see Python's dynamicness as a disadvantage in so much as an opportunity for us to write our code in a very dynamic fashion, where instead of a thousand lines of code necessary to implement that dynamicism being code that we wrote, being code that's in the interpreter itself. Every one of these layers, for the most part, was implemented from the perspective of people who've been writing C, C++, and Java systems for a very long time and saw common patterns arise in the writing of those systems. Common areas where people needed safety valves or needed hooks or needed ways to you know, slide in custom code or needed ways to make sure that the code was sufficiently generic to handle a bunch of different cases. And instead of writing that for the nth time in the next project, they took all of that knowledge they put it into the language itself, into the CPython interpreter itself, and then gave you a language that embodies all of these lessons of building systems. This is why in some presentations I've, con I've called Python not a systems programming language, but a system programming language, and that if you really look at all of the things that happen in all these layers, there's actually a system. Python itself is a system with a lot of moving parts, a lot of safety valves, a lot of very clever and careful engineering to it. And this can be a guide to writing very sophisticated Python code in a very short number of lines without adding too many unnecessary artifices, without inventing too crazy APIs by making use of some of the dynamicness, some of the, some of the space for encoding these problems that are provided by the language itself. So I hope that was an interesting tour of CPython. And I hope that for all of you, even those who have no experience with you know, anything beyond even introductory Python. I hope this was something that you were able to grasp and appreciate and something that you might feel comfortable looking at after this presentation's over in your free time. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure presenting for you. I hope you enjoyed that.